Welcome to the final session of Unite 2015. So you've made it through. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is assessing gameplay experience, which basically means how do you know you've made a good game? So have you made a good game is the first question. And if you think yes, how do you know that? That's what we're going to talk about for the next 50 minutes or so. And I'm going to show you the 10 ways that we do it to help other studios make number one games. So I'm basically going to show you everything that we do to help make your game very, very successful, which means players love it. And maybe you'll make some money too, but who knows? Well, who knows? So when your game is released, it is going to be plotted somewhere on this, on this chart. Just take a moment and look at this. Where do you think you're going to appear for your game? Let's take a look at some of the possibilities, perhaps. Um, and we'll start with good games that sadly did not make much money. So you may have heard of Punch Quest. Uh, when it was released, it was considered the indie darling. It was a beautiful game, and it still is, in fact. But the company who made it, the guys who made it, um, were very public in saying, you know what, we made a really good game, and everyone f reviewed it very favorably. But we actually didn't make much money. In fact, they publicly said how much they, were, they made at that point in time, which was $10,000, which wasn't enough, it turns out, to, uh, to sustain them. What was interesting about this is they also said, we don't know why. So we made a good game, and we always thought that if we made a good game, then people would pay us for that, which seems logical, by the way. So they also said, you know what? We don't know. And the other thing that surprised them when they did get some feedback, they said some of the things that could have caused our game to not make as much money as we hoped, they were very, very small. For example, maybe the buy button just wasn't big enough. They said, we don't know. So that was a shock to them, that some of the reasons for financial failure could be very, very small and very subtle indeed. They're not big and obvious at all. So let's look at bad games, which <laughs> I'm almost reluctant to show this. Bad games which have made money. This is not my opinion, by the way. I'm going on uh, publicly available figures. You ready? So if you love this game, I apologize. I'm sure it's wonderful. Again, I'm sticking to the data. And although it's got a reasonably good Metacritic score, the user score, as you can see, 3.7, the user said, no, it's not a great game. But it's a billion dollar game, so it fits into that category. What about bad games which have made no money? Well, I'm not going to tell you anything about that. And one of the reasons is uh, it's actually very hard to find data, because the people who make bad games don't go public and say, we made a bad game that didn't make any money. Right? That tends to not happen. And I don't want to offer an opinion. I'm trying to stick to the facts. So you can't maybe tell me later, though. So what about the last category? People who make good games and have also built successful businesses. Has that been done? Of course it's been done. This is Hearthstone. I'm sure many of you are playing this. Uh, I'm sure many of you are enjoying it. And I'm sure many of you are paying them some money as well. The latest figures as of uh, I guess this month or last month said that between Destiny and Hearthstone, it's made Activision Blizzard around a billion dollars. And they estimate that money is, is evenly split, so it's 50-50. So Hearthstone to date has made Activision Blizzard around $500 million, which you'd probably agree isn't that bad. It's not, not too bad at all. Many people would be happy with that. So here's the interesting question. Yes, all games will fit into this spectrum on release. They will be plotted somewhere on this graph. But you all want to make a, a game which lands in the top right-hand category. You want to make a great game. And you're running a business, so you need to make enough money. Your game has to be financially successful. So how do you do that? Well, there's probably the obvious answer is there's no magic bullet. But how do you increase your chances of doing that? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So there's two important things to consider to make good games that are also a good business. The first thing is, do you have a good idea? That game you're going to make, is the concept good enough? And the other thing that goes with that, of course, is if it is a good idea, are you going to make it to a good enough quality that people will love? This is obvious, 
right? But it's important to split this out. A good idea on its own is not enough. There are many games with good ideas, but they're bad games. They're badly made. You need to do both things, a great idea, and it has to be a polished gameplay experience. Right? You have to meet both of these criteria. But one of the important things is, this is not for you to decide. I'm sure anyone who's come up with a game design idea thinks it's amazing. It's very rarely you think, I've just come up with an idea and it sucks. You probably don't say that. You're more likely to think, my idea is pretty good. That's just the way we are. But that's not for you to decide. It's only if the player says so. And some of the best game designers in the world reiterate this fact time and time again. So here's a quote from Sid Meier who says, a game designer is just hypothetical. Until it's actually been played by your target audience, only then do you know if your idea works. So Sid Meier quite openly says, I come up with game design ideas all the time. And I don't know if they're good ideas. It's not my decision. If the players tell me it's a good idea, then I know I've got it right. So this is interesting, right? And Will Wright says the same thing, by the way. They both say the same thing. It's only if the player says so, then I know. Then I know I'm onto something. So if it's important that the player tells you you've got a good idea and you've implemented it well, how do you get that information during game development? How do you know, how do you get this data from the player to say, you know what, that thing you're making, it's awesome. And here's why. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I run a user research studio called Player Research, and our job is not to make games. But we work with many of the top game designers and studios who give us their game in advance, and we help them make it better. Does that make sense? And the reason we do that is by getting player feedback all the way through development. All the way through. Not at the end, not in the middle, all the way through. So if you look at how games were made in the past and where they got feedback from, it's quite an interesting history. So you can imagine this is your game development pipeline from concept, design, production, soft launch, launch. In the days of console game development, the typical way you got player feedback was you released your game, you put it on a shelf on a disc, and sometimes you would get the sales figures and the Metacritic score. And that was your feedback. That was it. How did we do? We got a 5 out of 10. Damn. OK, well, we'll do better next time. But the studio is closing, so you've heard it time and time again. This is not, these are not new stories. But that's, that, this was a very common story in console game development. The more ambitious and the more forward-thinking console game developers would have done some playtesting during production. So in that stage, as soon as they got a first playable, they would start putting it in front of people. Now, admittedly, some of those people would be their friends and family and other developers, which is not very useful, but at least they were trying to do something. So playtesting did happen sometimes in production. When free-to-play games come out a few years back and they were becoming popular, the situation actually got worse. Because what a lot of developers said was, we'll just wait until we get the metrics in. So we'll release our game, we'll push it out there in soft launch, we'll see what the metrics say. So again, you're waiting until the very, very end of your game, and all that's left is maybe some tweaking. But the fundamental idea of your game is too late. So the interesting question is, how do you do that? How do you do get feedback from the very, very beginning? And if you could do that, could you increase your chances of a hit game? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So these 10 methods today, this is what we do for companies um, from free to play, from console. It doesn't matter what your game is. Um, these are the 10 things that we do all the way through development to give studios feedback saying, that current build, that idea you have, here's how it's doing. So if it's not on track, if the players aren't doing the things you want them to do, you know right away. There's no waiting until the very end of development and going, oh, we made a mistake. The idea is you want to shorten the time span between you making something and you getting feedback on that something. You want to reduce that gap. And if you do that, your chances of, of making a successful game, critically and financially, dramatically goes up. So at the end of the talk, I'll show you some of the games we work on and some of the titles. I'm going to show you videos of um, some of the work that we've done. So what, do you, what can you get feedback on? So, so for us, there's four most important layers. If your game is free to play, these are the four layers you need to focus on the most. The top one is monetization. It's a business. You do need financial success because you have people to play, you have licenses to, to fund, all those sorts of things. Beneath monetization, the top layer, 
is player experience. Because if you don't give a, give a good player experience to the player, they're not going to pay you. So to get to the top layer, you need to satisfy the next layer down, which is player experience. Now, no one would disagree with that. If you make a good game, you're increasing your chances of someone paying you for that, for that title. That's fine. The more interesting question is, what does a good game mean? So for all the things that we see, there are two fundamental layers beneath player experience. The one beneath that is usability. And that means, can the player do what you want them to do? Are they actually, actually able to achieve it? Maybe it's the controls, something like that. But beneath usability, there's another layer, understanding. Does the player actually understand the rules of your game? Do they understand what's possible? So this is how these build up. If the player doesn't understand the rules of your game, then chances are they won't be able to do it. They're failing at usability. If they can't do it, they're probably not going to enjoy themselves. So they're going to have a bad player experience. And if they have a bad player experience, well, they're certainly not going to pay you. So these four layers are fundamentally built upon one another. And what you are trying to do in these 10 methods is to polish each of the four layers. We are certain the player understands our game. We are certain the player can do everything I want them to do. We're quite certain they will enjoy it, because that's more subjective, right? These bottom two layers are very much objective. We can measure them. We can prove that they're right or wrong. But proving that someone likes something, well, that's a whole other question. A well, bit fluffier. But we'll see how we cope with that later on. So this four-layer model is really important. And if your game is premium, it doesn't matter. You just chop the top layer off. The player experience, the understanding, uh, and usability are still critically important to you. The other thing to point out before we move on, when I say monetization, I'm not talking about the price of in-app purchases or anything like that. If you take the bottom three layers and map them into the top layer, for us, the biggest problems in monetization that we see when players play your games is these three bottom layers again. They don't understand what they're buying. They're not able to make a purchase. They're not satisfied with a purchase. So these three bottom layers map into monetization again. It's not about the, the cost of it. That almost doesn't matter. If they understand it uh, and understand the benefit and are pleased with that experience, that's really important. Here's another way of looking at it, which some of you may have seen. It's called the Swiss cheese model. And the Swiss cheese model is a way of, um, it comes from accident causations. So when a helicopter crashes or a plane goes down, this is the type of model they use to try and explain why did the accident happen? And basically, it works in the problem at the top, uh, on the right-hand side, you see the word problem. And that's the effect that you see. And for you guys, it's not a helicopter going down or anything like that. The effect may be uh, our review score wasn't high enough. We didn't get enough downloads. We didn't make enough money last month. If that's the effect you're seeing, that's at the end of the pipeline. That's your problem. So what you want to do is identify where is my problem coming from. And that's the, that's the idea behind the Swiss cheese model. So these are our four layers again. Understanding, usability, player experience, monetization. And each of these layers has a little problem in it, the hole in the Swiss cheese. These layers are not perfect. No one's game is. And all these holes are moving around in each layer. They constantly move around. And sometimes, just sometimes, they all line up. So a problem with the lowest layer with understanding as I said before, it causes a problem with usability, which means the player doesn't like it, which means they didn't pay you. And that's where you see the effect. No one give us money. But now you can start to identify where your problem is happening. This seems to be a usability problem or an understanding problem. You're starting to localize where the problem is happening. And the methods that come next will help us pinpoint where your issues are happening. So this is what we're trying to do. You've got these four layers that we talked about that are really important to successful games. They're vital to polish. And then we have these 10 methods, and their sole purpose is to add polish to the four layers. That's what they do. Each one on their own is not perfect. They're all flawed in some way. They don't polish all four layers. But when you add them together, you end up with a really polished game. That's why you need so many of them. That's why I was saying before, companies who just do playtesting, yeah, it's good, you should do it, but bear in mind, you're missing out the viewpoint of these other things. You're not seeing the full spectrum. You're not catching all the issues of why players get stuck and don't enjoy your game. 
So I'm going to run through these very quickly and just give you an idea. I hope you can do some of these in your studio. Uh, they will make your game better. They, they've got a long history in the fields of psychology and human computer interaction. That's where they come from. Um, we're taking the best of academia and applied it to the game industry. And this model, more or less, it's exactly what Pixar does to make movies. There are a few changes, but the principle behind it is exactly the same. They're saying we don't make bad movies because we catch them during production. And anyone who's read Pixar's book uh, will know that they made one bad movie. And we'll never see it because they didn't release it. The process that they had in place caught that it was a bad movie. And they decided it was not worth risking their reputation on a bad movie. They should make a better one. And that's great. That's what a process should be for. How are we doing? Is it on track to, is this representative of our studio? Do you want your brand to be associated with that game? If not, then do something about that. So these are the 10. But before we start, there's one thing you have to do. And that is, I would encourage you all to start describing who you think your game is for. So when we work with studios, and some of them are $100 million franchises, and some are one person in these studios, it's the full spectrum. No matter who you are, this is the first sheet of paper we send up to you. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it's very brief, and it's one page long. And it just says things like, what game are you making? Describe it in one sentence. What platforms are for? What stage of development are you at? It's just for us to understand what, what game are you making. But by far the most interesting part is the very, very bottom, the blue box. And it says, who is your game for? And you'd be amazed how many studios go, I don't know. Or they say everyone. Both of which are incorrect, of course. So this is a fundamental problem, because when you make your game, you're making design decisions on a daily basis. And if you don't know who you're making design decisions for, then is that a good decision? I don't know. So this is fundamentally important to the future success of your game. I can't stress this enough. You need to know who is my game for. Because everything you're measuring is going to be against this. It's not a good game for everyone. It's against people who love Hearthstone. It's against people who love you know, Pillars of Eternity or Destiny, whatever, whatever it is they're playing. That's the people we're reaching out to. So I'd encourage you to, you'll see some examples later of how, of how other studios do it. In fact, here we are. This is an example from the BBC. Um, and their user research division make personas, that's what they're called. Uh, they're not made up, they're based on real people. So they go out and interview people who they think would play and enjoy their game. And then they take the common characteristics of those people and represent it with three or four key personas. The further, your pers the further your audience is from yourself, the more important this is. So if you're making games for kids, in this case, we are not kids anymore. You know, we're people in our 20s, 30s, 40s, and beyond. We do not think like Ella. I wish we did sometimes, but we don't. There we go. So we need to remind ourselves, the game I'm making, by the way, is for children. And when I make a design decision, I need to know what Ella can do. I need to know how she thinks. And so they made some common, uh, they capture some basic info on Ella. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you'll see things like um, she has a Nintendo 3DS, but she doesn't like it because there's too many buttons. Oh, sorry, Nintendo. But th those are things that five-year-olds do. There are too many buttons. They have difficulty with key controls, for example, cursor, con cursor keys. They have great difficulty holding down right and up at the same time. So if you have to move in a diagonal or something like that, basic things. But you need to know this because these will help you make a better game for this audience. So I've shown you Ella in this case, but you should make personas for, for whoever your audience is. So here's the first of the 10 methods that I hope you take away. Uh, and the very first one's a concept test. And you can see that the concept test adds a little bit of polish to all four layers. So if you do this, you're slightly improving your chances in each of these four things. So how does it work? Well, you know pretty much how a concept test or a focus group would work. You bring people in who are in your target audience. That's why I had to mention personas, because you're going to bring the right people in. Not anyone, just the people you think could be suitable for your game. We're going to split them into groups, so maybe four or five at a time. Uh, and we're going to show them things about our future game. Maybe it's concept art, maybe it's features, maybe it's a competitor's game. The idea here is not to draw graphs and stats. That's not the purpose. The idea is to get insight into the people who love these sorts of games. Why do they love them? Did they make an in-app purchase? 
Why did they do that? Why did they not do that? We need to know. You need to know. So I'm going to show you an example um, of a game we worked on called Push and Pop uh, by a company called Delinquent. Uh, it's in soft launch at the moment. Um, but in this test, in this video that's coming up, you're going to see us showing three or four different prototypes of different art styles. That's what they wanted to know. Our game could look like this, or this, or this, or this. And by the way, one of these will be more successful than the others. And we just want to know which one and why. Why is the most important? Let's have a look. So, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was going to ask if there were any in the group before you saw that you had, let's say, a similar affection for um, to the candies. You say you like those. Is there anything that got close to that? My favourite one was the little, um, the number four, the that one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I like that one. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this one, this bottle's yeah. one. The bottles clink as they are moved or drop into play. The liquid inside behaves as you would expect when a bottle is moved from side to side or drops into play. I liked that. Yeah. That's what I really liked. That the really liquid moving. I thought, okay. oh, that would be really good. I so like when you're that. moving the bottle, yeah. the liquid yeah. sloshes around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I like about that one instead of the liquid moves. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, special potions will have layers of differently coloured liquid, like a cocktail. Mm -hmm. Anyone like that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bubbling liquids? Yeah, mm -hmm. like that. A lot of it's all about the clinking bottles and the different colours okay. of the liquids. And okay. yeah. So you get the idea. You heard also not just there was one clear winner, the one that looked like uh, the, the potions, um, but also we started to read out descriptions of what may be on the App Store or descriptions of how the bottles may move, and people resonated very strongly. Oh, I like that it moves. I haven't seen that before. So this was the one they finally went with, uh, the, um, the potions. I'm just going to show you what it looks like today. So this is a video taken from a preview on Pocket Gamer, maybe a month ago. Just to show you what the games here oh, on Can we mute, mute the audio? Effectively. Yep. So this is the final uh, animations based on what the, con the focus group said. And you can see as, the, um, as each one drops, you can see the, the liquid move inside each object. So again, when we, did, when we did the focus group, it was just a description. We said, by the way, the liquid will move, the bottles will chink, and now that all happens. This is the final, the final product. I think some of the developers are in this room, by the way, so maybe you can talk to them. You know. They'll have more information. Um, the most successful case, of course, of a concept test being very successful is Candy Crush. So Candy Crush, um, as we know it today, did not look like that initially. In fact, the company said, one of our first versions of the game was a French theme. It was a French male voice speaking to you. It was French themed. It did not look like this. And they said it was not successful. That did not do well. And they had similar stories as well. So if you think that the concept is not important to your game, King IPO'd for seven billion. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. The concept can be quite important, um, as you can see. People are making a snap judgment. Oh, that's not for me. I don't like that. And sometimes the variations are very small, as you saw in the previous example. But people were, no, that's the one I like. So it can be very useful for you. Other companies who do this or something similar would be uh, both Bungie and Riot. Before they make their characters in the game, they bring in people and they show them concept art, not only of the characters, but also the weapons that are in the game. And they say things like, how do you think this character would move? What do you think this gun does? And in many cases, they say people just got to, they just presume something different. The people don't move like that at all. The gun doesn't do that. But they caught it on paper. There's time to fix it. They did not spend time making the characters and 3D modeling or animation. None of that was done. They caught it at an early stage, at a time when they come back, can go back and finish it. So this happens in the industry a lot. Um, the second one's a uh, competitor analysis. Now, a lot of companies do this already. It's basically saying your game is going to be similar to someone else's. Sorry to say it. Uh, there are exceptions, and everyone does say my game's unique. I know, I know, I know. But there are bits of your game that are similar to someone else's. Maybe as a whole it is different, but components will be similar. So before you make your game, do you know why your competitors were successful? I don't mean external factors like marketing or anything like that. I mean just from a pure gameplay perspective. Do you know why they're good? What makes a good game a good game? 
again, this, this will affect all four layers. So one way of doing it, um, there's things called heuristics or guidelines. So when you're assessing your competitor's games or your own game, you need to do it as a team in an objective, measurable way. So yes, it's interesting that you've all got an opinion. That's, that's fine. You can put that in the mix. But a slightly better way is to say, well, these, this is the system we're going to use to assess games. This is an example, by the way, that you can change these things. Five of them are usability related, and four are gameplay related or user experience related. So you can say, OK, when we evaluate Hearthstone, we're going to look at the introduction, the Fatui, or the onboarding, the controls, the UI. And at least two of us are going to do this for each of these nine things. And then we're going to agree on how our competitors are doing. Because if you think Hearthstone's got an amazing tutorial, and I think it sucks, then we're not seeing the same thing. There's a problem there, right? We need to discuss that because we're working on the same game. So we need to make sure we are aligned very much on what is good about a good game. There are many, many examples of these. They're called uh, video game heuristics. Uh, you can download them. Uh, this is just an example one that we've used in the past. And later on, at the very end of the talk, I'm going to show you an assessment of a very large number of games uh, that we did using something similar to this. And you'll just get to see how many mistakes do developers really make? Does this work? Do they make simple mistakes, or are they, are they doing OK? So at the very end, I'll, I'll show you that. Just to give you an example of the sort of competitor analysis that, that we do, um, this is maybe a bit of overkill, but the first one we've just finished is on base builders. So Clash of, we compared Clash of Clans, Star Wars, uh, Game of War, uh, uh, and Boom Beach. Here's one page from it. And all we compared was when you place a building, a defensive building, and you get the UI feedback, who does it best? Is it Clash of Clans? Is it Boom Beach? The final report, as we go through all those games, is 250 pages long as we take these games apart. And that's only in the first hour of gameplay. So if you think you've seen it all after playing each game for maybe 45 minutes, I can tell you there's a bit more there. Um, the level of detail you need to go to to really understand how the player would feel is extraordinary. This just gives you an idea. Uh, Clash of Clans, by the way, does not come out well in terms of this particular one. So interaction analysis. By the way, it's important to point out, this yellow phase that we're in is all concept. You have not started making anything yet. This is you gathering information before you make your game so that you don't make mistakes, so that when you do start coding and making art, you're giving yourself the best chance. That's why we're spending this time up front. So an interaction analysis says, the controls you're making for your game, are they any good? Prove it to me. Yes, prove it to me. That's what I want. So this is an example from uh, a game called Battle Squadron. And it was on the Commodore Amiga. Anyone remember that? Yeah. It was on the Commodore Amiga, really, around 1988, 89. Uh, it's a vertical scrolling shoot 'em up And the guys brought it to iPad a few years back. But before they brought it to iPad, they put a video online saying, well, our game's coming, and it's going to use the Tilt control scheme. And I wasn't convinced that Tilt was the best way of doing that. So the guys. Uh, very graciously sent me a build of the game in advance, and they had built three control schemes, tilt, D-pad, and a touch base one. And the approach that you can take to help assess your controls is these numbers one to five, write down everything that you make the player do. So in your game, what are you making the player do? So for example, at a vertical scrolling shoot 'em up you have to stand still to avoid bullets. You have to do small movements for avoiding some pi pixel precision movement, large movements for doing collecting power-ups. You have to change between state, which means sometimes I'm moving small, sometimes I'm moving big, and then sometimes I'm moving left to right. There were 10 things in total for this game. This is just five. So you list the five things, and then you take each of your control schemes and rate them. It turns out tilt isn't that good. Who would have thought? D-pad, even worse. That doesn't shock anyone I know. The touch based control scheme that they did was actually wasn't bad. But there was a fourth one that was perfect. And they did not do it all. So we said to them, look, you're really close with your touch control scheme. And if you make this change, we think you'll satisfy, the, make the player feel great. So they now made that change. And if you download that game, that is the default control scheme, not tilt. So what's interesting about this approach is the game didn't have to be made at all. You can do this from a concept just on paper. 
That means you don't need to spend time making three control schemes. You make one, which is amazing. Another genre where we, we looked at was twin stick shooters. Uh, I'm sure you've all played twin stick shooting games. Basically, the, the left thumb stick will typically either move and one will move the camera, that, that sort of thing. And some twin stick shooters are amazing, genuinely fantastic. And some are awful. They just don't feel intuitive. And it turns out there's a reason for that. There's a very precise reason. There are actually four reasons. You'll see them in a second. But one of those reasons is when you take your finger off the screen, some game designers um, make the region still visible. And that means when you put your finger back down again, you're very unlikely to put it right back in the center. You're putting it slightly to the left or to the right. And that leads to camera jitter or your character moves. And that's very unsatisfying. The better way of doing it is when you take your finger off the screen that you remove the region of contact. So when the thumb goes down again, you redraw it at that center point, and it's fluid and feels wonderful. Just one example, the best game that we found at the time was Geometry Wars. Not on the iPhone, uh, it worked differently, but the iPad version was beautiful. And you can see the four, the four variables here that you have to uh, fulfill to make very successful twin stick, twin stick shooter games. This article is on Gamma Sutra. I wrote it around 2011, 2012. If anybody wants a PDF copy, it's much better presented. Just drop me an email at the end, and I'll send you, um, I'll send you all of it. So we're on into design. You, you spent your early time making sure we've gathered all of the best information possible. We've looked at the competitors. We've done an interaction analysis. We've done a concept test. We're armed with good information. Look how many chances you've had already of adding polish to your game. And you haven't even started design yet. OK, our coding. Um, during design phase, some of the things that you may want to do is bring in maybe another game developer or game designer to get an outside perspective on your UI. This is a game we worked on called War for the Overworld, which was a success, spiritual successor to uh, Dungeon Keeper. Um, Peter Molyneux gave it his, his blessing. And this is uh, the game director, the guy in the green t-shirt is Josh. Um, so he's the game director in the project. And the other two guys are two other searchers who tried to help refine the UI very early in development. So before they spend time making it and putting it in the code and putting it in the art, they just brought it in on paper and said, look, guys, this is what we're thinking of building. And the guys are like, OK, you, you could build that. But there may, we think there's a better way. And there's a full blog article on this, on how we uh, changed their design on the War for the Overworld uh, website. Um, the usability expert evaluation, I'm going to skip over because it's very much like the, the competitor analysis. It's basically saying use those guidelines to assess your current build. So within house, those guidelines that I showed, try and use them throughout development to say, how are we doing today? Playtesting, the most common one. I mean, developers have tried to do that, well, have been doing this for a long, long time. It's very popular, um, and it's popular because it adds credibility to the player experience layer. Gives you information, did we make it right? Are people playing the game exactly as we wanted? And if they didn't, well, hopefully you can pinpoint at what layer the problem is happening. Is it because they didn't understand? And you can get that through interviewing them. For example, tell me, what, tell me how this game works, or what can you do in this world? You can start to ask objective questions that will assess someone's understanding of your game. If it was the usability layer, you would have caught that through observation. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, perhaps. But most importantly, it's about the player experience. Are they, are they enjoying it? And this is an example of the, the sort of play tests, uh, setups that we use. You can use your own ones. It doesn't matter. I would recommend you're not in the same room as the player. So try and make sure you can stream it to somewhere else. And when you're taking notes, make sure there's at least two developers taking notes. Do not rely on one developer because they may not see the right information. You need to agree all the time, all the time. This is an example of a report that we did. Um, so just to show you the sort of output that comes out of a play test, there's a game coming up called Heat Signature by Tom Francis. Uh, and Tom Francis made a Gunpoint uh, on the PC. This is his new game. It's not out yet. But we've run a few play tests on it. And some of them were, were around specifically controls. Are people using the controls the way he wants them to? And if not, why not? What do we do about that? So there's a few things. You'll see, for example, we also highlight good practice. Sometimes a lot of developers, when they're watching a play test, they only talk about the bad. Oh, the player shouldn't do that. 
but you also need to note the good because you have to keep doing that. And at the bottom as well, you can see a suggestion. So as always, what do you do about this? So if you want to structure your own playtest reports that you're giving around your team, do try and highlight the severity, do a description of why it was a problem, and then outline a solution. What do we do about that? Try and keep it in some sort of structured format. And then we're getting to um, the engagement diaries. And engagement diaries are a way of assessing long-term play. Uh, quick show of hands, who's making a free-to-play game? OK, a few, quite a few, actually. All right. So for a free-to-play game, what you're really interested in is how would someone live with my game for a month, two months, a year? And if you're trying to get feedback in a lab, well, it's, it's in a lab. It's, it's very short. So how can you do it over a much, much longer period? Well, that's exactly what an engagement, di uh, engagement diary does. So this is an example from MMX Racing from, uh, from Hutch Games. Uh, it's a monster truck racing game. Uh, and during the end, during soft launch, we just wanted to know, how do people feel about this game over, say, two weeks to a month? So this is a, a quantitative measure. So every day, we got a pool of 20 players. I think it was 20 to play the game. And they had to rate the difficulty and the fun. That is a quantitative measure. It's interesting, but it's not the most interesting thing for us. The more interesting thing is how they felt. So we, to make your game better, uh, metrics are great for pinpointing where the problem happens, but they're not very good at all about telling you what to change in your game to make it better. And that's the information we're trying to provide today is saying, and this is the thing you change to get that better experience. So you can see some examples where the player had maybe early confusion or they weren't sure or they thought it may be repetitive. But later on, that's changed to a positive because they see a new truck arriving. So imagine you do this across a sufficient number of players and you start to build up a picture of, well, if everyone's getting stuck or everyone's getting frustrated on a certain day because of a certain thing, we can change that. But if you're not collecting qualitative measures, in other words, why? If you just collect, I'll just go back a second. If you're just collecting the quantitative, it doesn't, again, it's good at telling you where your problem is. But we also need to fix the problem. And that's why we need information like this. So the play tarries are very, very good at saying, OK, we've got a very good understanding of how you feel over a long period of time. So we're getting near the end of this journey, I guess. And the final thing is you're in soft launch. So you've been through the concept and design. You've made your game. You're about to push it out and get some feedback. And this is where metrics are very, very good, of course. So here's an LTV curve from the same game, MMX Racing. Uh, it's a 60-day curve uh, taking Q3 to 2014. I have to make it clear, that's a snapshot. This is a snapshot of that period. Today's graphs are very, very different. They've done many things to change. But in this point of time, let's just focus on this example. So the bottom curve is how they did before a certain update. And the studio thought, I think we can do better. And they did make three changes to the game in a controlled way. So they changed them in a way that they could measure the effect of each. It was a very, very uh, well-controlled experiment. As a result of those three changes, they saw, as you can see here, a 53% uplift to the second LTV curve. So here's the question for you. They changed three things. Don't shout out loud. It's OK. It's just a, a quiz for yourself. Of these three things that the company changed, which one do you think had the greatest impact on shifting that LTV curve? Which one made them more money, basically? Which one kept players playing longer? They're linked. Drum roll. The answer is the tutorial redesign. If you got that right, pat yourself in the back. <laughs> so of the three things, uh, just to give you a quick uh, summary, uh, loads more content was 14%. The tutorial redesign had a 30% uplift. And a rebalanced economy was 9 So getting more players through your game was at least twice as successful in terms of changing anything else. Do they want more content? Players will always say they want more content. But if you want to impact the bottom line and keep more players in and enjoy your game, 
this was the most successful thing that they did. So these are, these are all the possible ways, we're at the end of the talk, these are all the possible ways that we do to help make games a success. And there are a lot of them, there's some that aren't even on this chart. So hopefully you can do some of these things to really improve the player experience of your game. There are many, many ways. Just very briefly, I said I would show you the result of uh, <laughs> a large game study. <clears throat> This is 100 games from a single publisher. It's anonymized, of course. And that publisher hired us to ask the answer the question, how good are our games? How good are we doing? So each vertical strip is one game. And you can see this one that I've highlighted in black. There are two red dots somewhere on the player's journey. And red, as you can probably see, means catastrophic. In other words, the majority of players are very likely to leave your game because of that issue. Now, the nine issues down the side, in this case, I can't talk about them, I'm not allowed to say, but I showed you examples of some things earlier. You get the idea of some of the things that they are, UI, controls, or feedback. There are principles that apply to any game, because these 100 games I'm showing you, they're a very wide range, very, very wide indeed. So one of the metrics that come out of this is nearly three quarters of these games, 73%, had at least one red issue on the player's journey. And these are all experienced developers. So if you're starting to wonder, you know, this sort of thing, does it matter? We, we don't make those mistakes. We're, 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 we're perfect. Uh, maybe you are, by the way. That's awesome. I'm really, really pleased. <laughs> but most developers, uh, that's not true. Um, we did have the idea at the start of this, this uh, project of a super green. And a super green dot was best practice, like you are awesome. And we didn't really find many examples, so we, remo we removed the super green again. So examples of best practice, there wasn't even much of that. Green for us meant it was OK. Yeah, the player will probably carry through. Are you doing the best possible job? Hmm, possibly not. So these are some of the games that we have applied this process to. You've maybe played some of them. Uh, CSR Racing, or Classics, or Multiplayer. Rad Soldiers, uh, Dead Trigger 2. I saw the guys around earlier. Um, you get the idea. And these are just the iOS ones. We may, you know, there's also PC ones and all sorts of things. Um, the ones that we're quite proud of is every single iOS game we've worked on has made it to the front page of the App Store on release. That's not just due to us, I have to point that out. But it's, more, uh, it's in collaboration with the companies who, who are open-minded enough to say, what do you have to do to make the best game possible? Because we're told time and time again by developers, oh, I did everything I could to make the best possible game. And we say, did you do any of this or all of this? And they go, no. Well, you didn't do everything you could then to make the best possible game. Because these things are all player focused. The player doesn't care how you made your game. They don't care the, sl the, s the countless nights you slept under your desk to get that shader just right. That's awesome. But the player just wants an amazing game. And that's what this process is for. This is why Pixar uses it and other companies. It's to say, that person who, you're, who your game is for, do you really understand them? And do you, can you prove to me that they will love your game on release. These are just some of the studios, just to show you the breadth again. And there's one thing that keeps coming up, um, and people say, oh yeah, but what about luck? Where does luck come into this? Uh, and there's a great quote from a Hemingway book called The Old Man in the Sea. If you haven't read it, it's a, he's an old man, he's a fisherman, uh, and in the book he talks about luck. Uh, and people are basically asking, as a fisherman, is it better to be lucky like to be in the right place at the right time where all the fish are? Or is it better to be skilled, to know your trade and be a good fisherman? Which is it? Is it better to be lucky? Or is it better to be very good at what you do? And this is the quote. He said, it's better to be lucky, but I would rather be exact, because when luck comes, you are ready. Thank you. Mm. I think we have some time for, for questions, actually. I don't know. Do we? Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm interested in the two thumb input that you were talking about. I found out your article. Yeah, great. Uh, <laughs> thanks. You can leave a comment if you want. Uh, uh, yeah, I will. <laughs> um, yeah, do you have any info about uh, how the player, players that prefer the 
what do players think about the input itself? I mean, you, you use two hands. Do you have any <laughs> info about uh, anything that would... So it depends who you're making the game for, right? Yeah, um, for example, if this was a children's game, we would come up with a different control scheme and entirely. We would not recommend Twin Stick. Um, so I assume that this was for adults, for example. Yeah, for yeah. adults. Yeah. So, that, yeah. so you have to know who it's for and then um, work, work back accordingly. Yeah. But did you maybe found out any problems with people not liking the type of input? Um, this was a, this was not tested with real players. It was more of an algorithmic, you know, uh -huh. uh, objective point of view. But we know that the, the games that used the control scheme that we recommended got the highest ratings and the best feedback on the iTunes store. Uh -huh. So we looked at the other uh, comments on the iTunes store for those games. And in the full article, you'll see games that aren't as good. <laughs> uh, and the feedback for those games is saying, yeah, this this thing doesn't. It's not it's not very good. But players are very bad at telling you why. They won't go into the nitty gritty of the interaction design. That's not their job. All they say is, it doesn't feel right. And the games that feel awesome, they go, this is incredible. Um, so they're, they're very bad at articulating why. So it's our job to uh, do the articulation for them and say, this is the reason for it. Of course. Yeah. OK, thanks. Right. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know um, if your service is <laughs> payable for uh, little studios or <laughs> can you give us a price tag because I think it's really interesting for us but I don't know if yeah yeah yeah, yeah I mean most of the, I tried to show a bread to the people and you, some of them are very small indies two men uh, and some are EA or Sony or so it's, uh, I'll talk to you afterwards about that yeah sure but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the games we work on are for indie developers. Uh, I didn't say this, but um, I was at Unity in 2006 for a very brief period. I was on loan. I was an academic on loan to Unity. And one of the principles I took away from Joachim and David, and David Helgeson was democratization. That really was at the fundamental core of that company. Uh, and when I started player research, that was the first principle as well, which was whatever we do, uh, indies have to have it, access to it, and also large studios. So it was important to us that that happened. Uh, how do you do one update and then know afterwards which of the three things you changed impacted how much of the uh, stuff? I mean, <laughs> do you do like one, one third of the clients get only this patch and one third get only this patch? I, yeah, I don't know the exact details of how they A-B tested it, but I know they did it in a, in a controlled way. It's probably something similar to what you said, you know, where a selection of the audience got uh, one modification, then they measured that, and then they repeated it. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the, so that game got to number two in the charts after three days or something. So they, they had quite a lot of players, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else? Are you all not going to make perfect games? That I mean, means I could retire, which would be great. So. Round up. Round up? All right, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>